key words that are talked about filling, and both of them happen to be used with the Holy Spirit. And one of them is used in the Gospels. Can anybody think of anybody in the Gospels that says he was filled by the Spirit? Before he was even born. John the Baptist. And guess what? That's not this verb. It's a different verb. Let me see if I, let's see if I have this here. Oop, going backwards. Okay. Okay, here's the two words. You can see the English pronunciations below there. Oh, my arrow got messed up. See, I put this all together in Mac because I'm a Mac guy, and then I tried to transfer it to PowerPoint, and everything didn't work, so I apologize. Anyway, you can see the, the two words in the set down below, and we have the word plerao, which means to fill a lack or deficiency. Something is lacking. Think of a glass half full of water, except when we're talking about the filling of the Spirit in Ephesians 5.18, you've got a glass that's empty. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it needs to fully be filled up, okay? But it's, it's lacking something. Whereas the other word, the Greek word pimplemi, and another form of that pimplemi, the word plato, which is following it, that word means to fill or fully control. And it's a term that referred to the Old Testament and the first part of the book of Acts. I think the last place it's used in Acts, if I remember, is like Acts 13. I, I think that that's where it occurs, or Acts 11. It's where, it's where Paul and Barnabas are on Cyprus, and there's a magician uh, there that's trying to turn away the proconsul from the faith. And Paul says, being filled with the Spirit, and he uses that the second word down here. He's using this word, pimplemi, that's what Luke uses, being filled with the Spirit. It, Paul looks at him, and from his mouth he says, you, full, you uh, son of, son of uh, see, I should have looked this up to, this morning to remind myself, but son of all guile, uh, how long will you uh, turn away like this? And he says, you're going to go blind. And the Holy Spirit actually controls him. Uh, and this happens, this term is used several times. It causes John the Baptist to leap within his mother when Mary comes in. It's also used of others in the Gospels, and it's used others early in the book of Acts, but it fades out because today the Spirit does not control us. The Spirit is filling up a deficiency. Now, I realize this is a change of definition because many people are teaching when they talk about the Spirit filling in Ephesians 5, they talk about it as spirit control. There's one thing that's very logical about that. If the Spirit really did control us, you could be guaranteed that if I got up here to speak or Mike or your pastor or anybody else that gets up here to speak, you could be guaranteed all they had to do is make sure they're spirit-controlled, spirit-filled, and every word coming out of their mouth would be exactly what God wanted said. But I know that that's not the, not the case because as my wife even pointed out on Friday night, I gave you a scripture reference and it was the wrong one. So you might have been, and I do that once in a while. The people in my church are going, wait, wait, wait a second, wrong verse, we can't find it. And I'm going, what did I tell you? And they tell me, that, oh, yeah, no, we're in here. And my mind is thinking this way, and I told them this, okay? Uh, I would never, it would never happen. And that is what, that, that, that is what this Old Testament filling, pimple me in Plato, uh, and really keep in mind, keep this in mind. When you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is that New Testament or Old Testament? That's Old Testament because it's before the cross. See, I really appreciated that. I got to hear that from you guys. A lot of churches, you'd ask that question, and they go, well, that's New Testament because I put it in the New Testament in my Bible. But it really is pre-cross, okay? And so you're still standing really on Old Testament ground when this term is being used in the Gospels. And, the, and God the Holy Spirit is filling people then to control them, oftentimes to control not only what they do, but even more so what is coming out of their mouth. So that Peter on the day of Pentecost, I, I, I listened to one, uh, one speaker a number of years ago that said, could you imagine all the Bible study Peter must have been doing to get ready for that message on Pentecost? I don't think Peter was doing Bible study. That message came because he was filled by the Spirit and the Spirit controlled everything every single thing he said. I don't think Peter could have put that stuff together had it not been for that filling in that context. And that happens other times in the, in the book of Acts. Anyway, all that to say, the word we're talking about, this term, plerao, this is for us. And that's supposed to be an us there, but like I said, my arrows moved. And that type of filling is that which fills up a lack or a deficiency. Okay, and... Okay, okay, they're just... Uh... Now, 
I want to look at some other places where the word filling is used in Ephesians. We're trying to stick primarily to Ephesians, so go back to chapter 1. Back to chapter 1. And if, and if you get this, and, and remember, one of your responsibilities as a believer is always to test anything that anybody ever teaches you, to test it against the Word of God. Look at it, examine it, and if the Holy Spirit teaches it to you, then you, then you make it yours. And at that point, you might want to take a pen and you might want to go through and mark these. If you, if you come to understand this, you might want to mark these and put these all together so that you can reference them in the future for yourself. But in Ephesians chapter 1, and verse 22, it's, it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, first of all, and God the Father, and he, the Father, subjected or put in submission all things under his, the Son's, or Jesus Christ's feet, and gave him, that is the Son, to be head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness. Now that word is is simply a nominal form, a noun form of the word fill. And it has on its end, and you can even see this in, in even though it's in English here rather than in the Greek, that ma ending, that M-A on the end of this, play ro, remember that should be a long O, play ro ma. And that ma ending indicates a result of an action. So this word means the result of having a deficiency filled. Does everybody get that? Fullness means the result of something being filled full. And he says that's what the body is. The church is the body, the fullness. And then he goes on, the fullness of the one, uh, of the one filling, this is the Lord Jesus Christ now, filling the all things by all means, which is one of those passages that makes us really scratch our heads and go, what in the world does he mean fill all by all? or all in all. You know, your Bibles have a tough time. But I b- believe what he's getting at, and this is gonna, he's going to get at this later in the letter, and we talked about this yesterday, is that he's going to use all the parts of the body of Christ, and he's going to be filling all those parts of the body of Christ by all the other parts of the body. He's going to take these parts, and he's going to bring them together, and he's going to, because we saw that yesterday. He provides a supply for the body's growth. But he doesn't do it direct to you. He does it oftentimes to you through other believers that their work, their ministry of their spiritual gift, or as Mike said, if you're a believer, guess what? You can do all of the spiritual gifts. You can can fulfill the role of a pastor teacher to a limited degree when there's not a pastor teacher to do it himself. But that may not be your gift. The pastor teacher is going to be able to do that better. He's going to be more proficient at it because that's what his gift is. But all of us, by virtue of salvation, are able to do all these things. So as I use the illustration sometime, I don't have the gift of mercy, but I've had many opportunities to go and demonstrate and show mercy to people, even though it's not my gift. God does give me the ability to do that. So sometimes, uh, way back when, when I was in seminary, I remember one of my professors said, it used to irk him. He would have students, they'd have church work day where people would show up and they'd, you know, painting and things that need to be fixed around the building and they try to get as many people to show up so they can, you know, get it all done by noon. And the seminary guys wouldn't show up. And he said, you didn't show up for the work day. And they go, well, that's not my gift. <laughs> and he says, I wanted to just, well, he was a little bit nicer than this, but essentially I wanted to reach across the table and go, crunk. <laughs> What's the matter with you? You're part of the body of Christ. You serve. See? But that's what Jesus is getting, or that's what Paul's getting at, is that he fills all things by all these gifts, by all these people, either using their gifts or simply serving in in the normal Christian service, whatever that might be. And so this is one of the examples of filling in fullness. Uh, Chapter 3 here in Ephesians. Chapter 3, we talked about this one yesterday. If you remember in the context here, Paul is praying. He's asking the Father for something. And what he ultimately wants is that these people would grasp how big or how large the body of Christ is. And so he says in verse 19, uh, and to know the surpassing knowledge of the love. Now, for those of you that were here yesterday, It's not the love of Jesus Christ here. It's the love of the Christ. To know what it is experientially to love all of the body with Christ as its head. 
That's the way he's using the term the Christ in this context. Your English Bibles do not have a the in front of it, but there is, and I believe he's making a reference here to Jesus Christ in connection with his body. And he says he wants them to be able to grasp what it is to love the whole thing. Then he goes on. And he says, in order that you should be filled. Interestingly enough, this, well, that's right, you can't see this here. Um, same passive form of this word fill that he uses over in Ephesians 5.18, that you should be filled unto all the, let me see if I can go back here. Let's, uh, right here, okay. Here's our word. See this word here? Can you see the Greek? Kind of, kind of English chicken scratch. We're going to go back. Oh, oh, no. Oh, we don't have to go back because I already have, it's, oh, oh, man, <laughs> I'm trying to get used to a different pointer. Uh, this term, you see these two, two words, how they're the same? Filled up to all the fullness. He's talking about the same thing. He's talking about the body of Christ. He says, I want you to be filled up to fully what the body of Christ is. Now, if, you're, if, you're, if the wheels are turning in your mind, those little gears are meshing in here, hopefully you're seeing you're thinking about filling, and you're going, hmm, is this going to have bearing on what Paul means by filling when we get to chapter 5? Yes, it is. Look at uh, chapter 4 here in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and uh, first of all, verse 10, which I do not have up here, but Ephesians 4, 10, it says, the one having descended himself is also the one having ascended far above all the heavens in order that he might fill thee all things. So it's talking here again about Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ filling all things. And then you go down to uh, verse, uh, uh, verse 13. And in verse 13, he says, until we arrive, uh, all of us at a oneness of the faith, we're not there yet. We're not, all, we're not all in agreement, not all believers in agreement, but there's a day coming we will. Uh, even unto a full experiential knowledge. He doesn't just use the word experiential knowledge. Uh, in the Greek, we have two words for knowledge. We have oida, which means knowledge by seeing something. I am terrified of the water, but my wife will tell you, I have this incredible fascination with watching videos on YouTube. When I can't sleep in the middle of the night, I pull up on YouTube and I watch people sail. And I sometimes watch people sailing in high seas. You know, the water's crashing. I can see it. There's a lot of things I've learned by sight, but I've never been out on a sailboat out on the ocean. I've been on a lake once. But, so I have an oida kind of knowledge. But there's also another word. It's the Greek word gnosko, and it's knowledge that involves experience. It's you've done this. You've learned about it, and you've exercised this. You've operated in this sphere, and it's gnosko. But he doesn't even just use gnosko here. He uses epigenosko, which is a stronger form. In other words, real experiential knowledge. We get some people in our church that like to get together and shoot once in a while. And we go down to Edward's house, and Edward's got a, a, a range down behind there. And there's guys like me that pull the guns out maybe once every couple years and go out there and plink away, and I'm kind of... And then there's guys that are really proficient, and they're like... Boom, 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 boom. And you're like, wow! Because they're proficient. They're, they're, they, have so, they have such good experiential knowledge with what they do that it's just natural. They sight in so quickly. Well, he says here, what I want for you is for all of us, this is the goal, is that we all come to not just, an ex, not just a head knowledge about the sun, not just, not just an experiential knowledge, but a full experiential knowledge. We really get to know him. Think of somebody that's been married 30 years versus somebody that's been married three days. Or one year, you know. Hopefully you know your spouse. But after 30 years, you really should know your spouse. And so he says, Under the full knowledge of the Son of God, unto a mature, mature one, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of the Christ. That is when the Christ is seen as complete or is completely full. Now this is a real interesting thing of, that he said. Over in chapter 1, from God's perspective, he sees the Christ, he sees the body as already completely full. From God's perspective, he sees it done. But it may not all be done. Because there may be today people, maybe somebody even that shows up for church here, 
that has never believed in Jesus Christ. And today is the day that they're going to hear the gospel, believe, and they're going to come into the body. So the body may not be on, in reality, complete yet or full yet. But from God's perspective, he already sees it as full. God can see things that are not yet as though they are. And so he looks at it here as the body of Christ as being completely full. And that's the day we're looking for. We're looking for the day that every member of the body of Christ is in the body of Christ. Everybody's there. It's complete. It's done. Okay. So these are, the, these, are these key passages in Ephesians. Paul expects that by the time you get to Ephesians chapter 5, remember, this is a letter. Some of you still remember what letters are, right? You know, you actually got a letter in the mail, you know, not just an email, actual letter, you held it in your hand, you read it. And how often when you got that letter did you just, oh, grandma sent me a letter. My grandma, I, my grandmothers and I used to correspond. I never just took my grandmother's letters and took it and jumped to some paragraph, uh, you know, four-fifths of the way down the letter and just started reading. I started at the beginning and read through the letter. So that sometimes something she might mention down here, oh, we did this, I would go, well, that's an odd thing. To, oh, it made sense if I went back and I read what she said earlier. Paul expects us to have done the same thing when we're reading the letter to Ephesians. That we have already read to this point. So that when he gets to chapter 5 and verse 18, and he talks about this filling of the Spirit, that we have an idea that he's not talking just about some filling and we make it whatever we want it to be. It's controlled by the context of the book and the context of the book has been telling us that this fullness and this filling have to do with the body of Christ. This identity that we all share in one body. And he says, and you need to be filled by the Spirit for this. Okay? Now, Hmm, I'm missing something here. Oh, okay, there it is. Now, the next thing we want to talk about is we want to talk about the form of the word spirit and that word spirit on the end, and you can see in this case, pneuma, P-N, like pneumonia, pneuma, and then at the end you can see that T-I, pneumati. Most of you could probably pronounce that English, okay? Pneumati spirit. That is in the Greek what we call the lid case. Lid case stands for locative, instrumental, and dative. Those are the three functions, three primary functions of the lid case, okay? Locative means it's a location. Instrumental means how a thing is done. And dative is like we have in English, I throw the ball to you, okay? This is the locative case, or instrumental case is the way we're, un way we're understanding this. And that, that particular case, oh man, this really did <laughs> mess it up. With the preposition and, those, this should be the E-N out here in front. I had this straight at home, I just, anyway, I apologize. The E-N out front, that's the preposition and, it's kind of equivalent to our in or by, sometimes with, but in this case, in, when you use those along with the, this verb, plerao, with that verb, it talks about the means. It talks about how you do a thing. Okay? So that, here's Ephesians chapter, or Acts chapter 6, verse 3. We have a different case here. Now, because of the Greek here, if you look at that word pneumata, it looks like it's got that I can't remember what the letter was from German, but it, this is pneumatas, not pneumati, okay? You see that funny ending on the ending of that pneuma? That is the genitive ending, okay, in the Greek. So it's a different case of the verb. And with that, when you use the genitive case with words of filling, the genitive case indicates what a thing is filled with. Not how you fill it, but with what. Picture it like this. If I have a glass here, Glass is the individual. I have a pitcher. Inside the pitcher is some liquid, water, Kool-Aid, I don't know what it is, something like this, and I have the pitcher. When I speak of it in the terms that Paul is using in Acts, then I'm saying that the liquid inside, that's what I'm filling. I'm filling this glass with the liquid, right? We got that picture? But the form of the word that he uses in Ephesians is not talking about the liquid. It's talking about the pitcher itself. The pitcher is what I'm using to put the liquid into the glass. You got that picture? Can you see that? Okay. And I think, 
Okay, so there's, there's a, well, see, it's still all messed up. But anyway, you can see this. The genitive over there on the, on the, on the left, okay, that's the genitive form versus the uh, instrumental form uh, indicating the means. So picture it like this, okay? The spirit is the stuff with which one is filled. So you look at that liquid, that would be the case in Acts, okay? The spirit's the stuff. Whereas this one, it's the pitcher, Okay, everybody get that? One more time. Back. This is Acts. This is Ephesians 5. Okay. So, we go back over here to Ephesians chapter 5. Having understood that now, let's, uh, let's all turn to Ephesians 5.18 if you're not back there already. Ephesians 5.18, he says, uh, Be filled by the Spirit. Now that term, that word, be filled by the Spirit, is... Uh, uh, a present tense verb. It is passive. Everybody knows what passive is? Passive versus active. Uh, picture it this way. Active is, I have a ball and I throw it. Passive, I'm at my friend's pool and somebody big enough to pick up this 190 pound guy throws me in. See? That's passive. Somebody throws me. I am thrown. Okay? And so that, this is passive. I don't fill myself, obviously. I'm being filled by the Spirit. The Spirit is doing the filling, okay? But I'm being filled by the Spirit. He's going to do this, okay? And then there's one last detail on it. It's also an imperative. An imperative in the Greek is saying, this is something that is very, very important for you to get. And I am urging you, I am appealing to you in the strongest way I can with the Greek language that you need to do this. And so he says, be filled. But this is the question. How in the world, we're going to talk about this in just a little bit here. How in, the world are you, how in the world are you passively filled? How do you fulfill a passive imperative? Now, if we were Pentecostalist, we'd, it'd be easy. Spirit, fill me. Fill me, Spirit, fill me. Rain on me from heaven. We're not Pentecostalists. And so we're not going to bring in a bunch of nonsense outside the Word of God. The Word of God constrains us. And the Word of God actually is going to tell us very plainly how this happens. But before we do that, we want to look through the remainder of this passage, and we want to look at some of these different terms that he uses in here. Uh, oh, no, it's not going to work. There it is. Okay, we'll just do it that way. I'm singling out the main things. This up here, be filled, this is the main verb. These in the Greek, for those of you that remember English, these are participles. They're never the main verb. And in this case, these participles, these participles in here, speaking, singing, psalming, giving thanks, and submitting, these are all the results of being filled. I had a friend in college, a roommate, uh, lives over in Houston now. He read this passage, and he thought singing and psalming, and I think some of your Bibles say singing hymns. Uh, I, hymns not up there because hymn is a noun in this. It's not a participle. And he went out and bought a hymn book. And I said, Blaine, what'd you get a hymn book for? And he says, well, I went out and got a hymn book because that's how you get filled. And I said, Blaine, that's not how you get filled. That's a result. Singing hymns is a result of being filled. You don't sing a hymn to get filled. It's a product. Let's walk through these things very quickly, what he's talking about. Um, the first thing he says in here is that we are speaking. And he says literally in the Greek, and we're going to talk more about this in just a minute here, he says we're speaking to ourselves. Now, some of your English Bibles, your modern translations translate speaking to one another. And that actually is completely misleading, and it's going to miss the very point that Paul is getting at. It derails the very thing Paul's trying to get at, and we're going to see that here in a minute. He says you're speaking to yourself. This is something you're doing here. We're going to see this. I'm speaking to myself. And he says, I'm speaking to myself. Notice what he says here in verse 19. By means of psalms, by means of hymns, and by means of spiritual songs. The first thing the Spirit knows that I need is I need to talk to this guy right here. I don't need to go talk to you. In fact, in the context of Ephesians, when I think that you are my problem, who do I want to go talk to? You or somebody else. Mike, did you know that Steve did? Nah, 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 nah. And I don't know why we do that. I don't know why we think we need to go run off and tell somebody else that. There's one person we ought to talk to about that. First of all, ourselves and then God. 
<laughs> but he says we speak to ourselves in Psalms. That doesn't mean we go back and we read a Psalm out of the Psalms. We might. But a Psalm is simply a word that meant you're, spe you're speaking some praise something to God about the character of God in connection with his activity. Praising. Uh, we had an example the other night in Ephesians 1 6. He says, to the praise of the glory or the reputation of his grace, which, which he graced us. And now Jesus don't say, God's very gracious. People, okay, well, give me an example. Well, he graced us in the loved one, the one that is loved. He has given us things in Christ we don't deserve. Oh, that's a good example of grace. See, that's what, that's what a psalm or a praise does. It points out what that character of God does. By the way, Praise is, according to Hebrews 13, it's one of the spiritual sacrifices you as a believer priest can do. And he says over there, it's the fruit of your lips. Because you know what? Sometimes you're not the only one that needs to hear about the character of God. Sometimes you're going to have other believers and they're going to come into church or you're going to run into them and they're like, what's the matter? You just wouldn't begin to know. And you begin to say, hey, boy, you know what? We've got a God. You know, you know what God did the other day? You know what God's doing right now? And you start talking to them about God's activity and his character. And those believers are like, huh, I needed to hear this. I needed someone to remind me of who God is and what he's doing. Psalms. Secondly, hymns. The difference between a hymn and a psalm, hymns aren't what you call in your hymn book. Most of the songs in hymn books are not hymns. Because the Greek word hymn, referred to as something, an ode, or something that you said. It could be recited or it could be sung. It didn't necessarily mean it was sung. In the Greek, it could be just a recitation, but it could be sung. But it was something that focused strictly on the character of God. Sometimes you just need to remember, you know what, God, you are good. You don't need to say you're good because you gave me food. That would be praise. You just say, God, you are a good God. You are absolutely, do you know what it means when we say God's good? We're not, it, good is not what you say to your kids when you leave them home with a babysitter. Be good. What you really mean is be righteous. The Greek word good does not mean that. The Greek word good, agathos, refers to the fact that God has a sense of well-being. Our God is not a God that's up there. I can't get comfortable. I'm, do you see what's going on down there on earth? Oh, God's not like that. Our God is a God that is the acme of happiness. The acme of contentment. The acme of having well-being. We need to remember that. That's one example, one of God's character characteristics. Now, sometimes we praise him and connect it with a benefit, but sometimes it's just a him. This is who you are. And then the last one he says, and spiritual songs. Spiritual songs are, are they may be songs that you've heard on the radio. They may be songs you learned at church. But this is what they are. They're a song that reinforces truth. Now, I don't know if your church does this, but our church is really notorious. We could get in a lot of trouble probably for doing this. But we are notorious for changing words and songs. <laughs> because I just refuse to sing songs that don't teach truth. And we have some really good hymns and such in our hymn books and other songs that it's like, you know, if you change those two words to this, now this song says something. This, that's not right. That's error. I don't want to reinforce error because it's amazing how much you can spend hours teaching this, but what does somebody do when they're at a Bible study? Oh, yes, that song. I heard it on Caleb. Oh, da, da, da. And you're going, oh, nails on a blackboard. That is not right. Maybe it is a good song. Anyway, a spiritual song is a song that, that reinforces some truth you need to remember. I'm going to give an illustration. One of my professors took a song by Dottie Rambo uh, called He Looked Beyond My Fault and Saw My Need. And she had this one verse, and he added three more verses to it. And we sing this at our church every once in a while. And, uh, uh, boy, I remember probably one of the best... I've sung this song so many times when I'm in situations where my mind doesn't want to get in the right gear because I can get singing this song, and it really re it reinforces truth. And the one, the one line goes right along with what we're, we're saying about this is the last verse, and my singing voice may not be up to par here this morning. It goes, Made near to God and seated in the heavenlies, in Christ I died, was raised, am not condemned. I'm one with Christ, placed as a saint and highly graced. Complete in him, in Christ I have no need. That, that one stanza reinforces so much truth about who we are in Christ. 
And we've got, we have lots of songs. That was just one that I was thinking, it's a good illustration of this, because God brings that to mind. But you know, I've had nights when I'm all by myself, I'm driving to a Bible study, and I'm thinking about truth, and I'm thinking about the things that God's doing, and boom, a song comes out of nowhere. I've never heard it before. It's just a song that the Spirit gives me, and I'm going, man, this is great. i got to write this down. And by the time you get to Bible study, I can't remember the song. But it was an absolute blessing. It's that song that God gave me for me and my relationship with him in that moment. And you wish you could write them down because you're thinking, I want everybody else to do it. But it was actually for you. So sometimes that's what it is. But the Spirit is going to give these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Secondly, he goes on. He says, speaking to yourselves. And then he says in verse 19, singing and psalming in your hearts to the Lord. So he says, you not only, you don't just stop with yourself, but now you're going to go on and who you're going to talk to next. First, you're talking to yourself. Secondly, he says, now you're going to talk to the Lord. And you're going to talk to the Lord in singing and psalming. You're going to sing psalms to the Lord. You're going to sing praises to him. And you're going to sing these other songs. But you're directing, now, it, now it's not just for your benefit, but you're directing it back to God. Not because God's an egomaniac and needs to hear it but because God knows you need to be communicating to him. God knows you need to be remembering this. Uh, so psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and then singing and making melody, or singing and psalming in your heart to the Lord. And then verse 20, and giving thanks always for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even our Father, even the Father. The third thing that the Spirit fills you with is thankfulness, that you're thankful for everything that's gone right. No, he says you're thankful for everything. He says, you are thankful, he says, in or on behalf of all things, and you're thankful in the name of Christ. That does not mean you attach the name Christ at the end. It means that you're doing it like Christ would do it. And I don't know how Christ would do it, but the Spirit does. And so the Spirit fills me with the ability to actually thank God like my Savior would have thanked God. So it's in his name. It's in his character. And lastly... Verse 21, this is the first time you get others involved. Then you are submitting to one another. And now he changes to a preposition, or a pronoun, excuse me, the pronoun alelos, which does refer to other individuals. And then he goes on and specifies different ways that that's, but this is what the Spirit fills you with. Now, why does the Spirit fill you with these things? Because what you and I need most in our relationship with other believers in the body of Christ is to get along. And you know what the biggest problem is in getting along with other believers in the body of Christ? It's me. It's me. It's that I get in the way. It's that I have an agenda. It's that I have a thing. I've got a beef. I've got a chip on my shoulder. You rubbed me this way. You said this, that, not that. And it's all those things, and I need to be filled by the Spirit so that instead of going off and flying off at the mouth at everybody else, I talk to this guy first. And then I talk to God. And then I thank God. <laughs> thank, thank God in this situation? Yes, thank God in this situation. And then submit. You mean I'm going to submit to those jokers? Yeah. Because they're part of the body of Christ through which he is filling me. Because he fills all things by all means, by all these parts with these different things that we all need to be growing. And he says, that's what we need. And I'm not going to submit to you if, I, if these other things. And I don't make myself go through this. This is what the Spirit does. This is being filled by the Spirit. It's passive. Now, turn to Colossians chapter 3. <clears throat> because we asked this question a little bit ago, how are you passively filled? Well, you're passively filled by knowing that there is something that you are supposed to do. But Paul doesn't say it, tell it to the Ephesians, because remember, he spent a long time with the Ephesians, and the Ephesians knew what Paul meant. But the Colossians, whom Paul had not met, and we, we get that hint at the end of chapter 1, the first part of chapter 2, where he says, all those who I have not seen face to face. So the Colossians, we believe, are some of the people that were reached by other believers while Paul was at Ephesus. Remember, it says that the gospel went out through all of Asia in the space of time that Paul was in Ephesus. But Paul didn't meet all these people. 
And so Paul writes to these people, and he gives them some details in this letter that he doesn't have to tell the Ephesians. And so he says here in Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to go first to verse 15. He says, let the peace of, and I would say this is the peace of the Christ, the peace that is the reality within the body of Christ, with Jesus Christ. Said, he says, let that umpire in your hearts. He used this word umpire earlier because there were people that were using the law, imposing law on Christians, and they were using the law as the gauge for calling people out or safe. You're keeping the Sabbath. You're safe. Oh, you don't keep Sabbath. You're out. And that's what they were doing. And he says, no, you let the peace of the Christ umpire in your hearts to which you were called in one body. You were called this. See, this is one body. This is what he's talking about. And become thankful ones. And then verse 16, and let the word of the Christ. Okay, everybody look up here. That's not this. He is not talking about the Bible. He's not saying, let the word of God. He says, let the word about the Christ dwell richly in you. That truth that tells you that you're a part of this body, but that body doesn't stand alone because that body stands in an intimate union with its head, Jesus Christ, and together God looks at it as the Christ, and it is one new man. And by the way, he refers to that new man up in the context here in Ephesians 3, where he says, you put off the old man and you put on the new. And that new man is not the new me. It's, it's the body of Christ with Christ as the head. He says, you let that truth, let it dwell in you richly. This is not dwelling you richly. I'm in Christ. I'm in the body. Yeah, I know. We're seated at the Father's right hand. Yeah, yeah. That's not dwelling you richly. Dwelling you richly is like, this is a reality. I'm part of it. And you don't have to get excited about it, you understand. I'm just trying to illustrate it. But it's like, I'm part of the body. I am knit together, knit together with these people. We're not in loose association. God sees us as knit together. And he sees us as knit together like this, and I let that reality. And Jesus Christ is the head of this whole thing. That's why it's, he doesn't call it just the body here. He calls it the Christ, because Jesus Christ is the head of it. He's the one in charge of this. And he says, I let that dwell in me richly. And then he says, and then notice what he says in the last part of this. He's going to do the same thing he did in Ephesians, and he's going to talk the same thing. He says, in all wisdom teaching and admonishing yourselves. Now, now look up here for the parallel. Over here he said speaking. But in Colossians, he breaks speaking out into two things, teaching and admonishing. In other words, and he says, what does he say? Teaching and admonishing. Look at it here in your Bibles now because I don't have it up there. It says teaching and admonishing yourselves in psalms, in hymns, and in spiritual songs. The same thing he's talking about in Ephesians 5. And what he's saying is, I need to teach myself by means of these psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. I don't need to teach you. It's not a one another here. It's myself. I need to talk to this guy in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs because I'm the problem. Oh, I know. We always think it's other guys that are problem. No, I'm the problem. So I need to talk to myself, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and I need to admonish myself. Does everybody know what admonishment is? In the Greek, it's actually the word to put in mind. And it has the idea, think of... Think of uh, your kids maybe can relate to this. Your mom and dad, you ever do something and then your mom and dad, they're, they're not exactly happy you did this. And so they kind of talk to you about it. And your parents might not say, no, don't do that anymore. They might just say, so think about that. So think about that next time. That's really what the word admonishment is. It kind of has a little bit of a negative tone, but it has a negative tone in the sense of, think about this. Think about this next time you face this situation. Think about, think about what you did. Think about how you responded. And that's what he's talking about here. So he says, you need to admonish yourself. You need to go, hey, Tim, you need to think about this, bud, the way you responded. Then he goes on. Not only he says, do you, do you speak to yourself and psalms, teach and admonish yourself, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, but then he also goes on, singing in your hearts. Now, he, he truncates this a little bit. Over here, it was singing and psalming. Here's just singing, but it's the same thing he said over there. He says, singing in your hearts to God which is that's what he was telling us over in Ephesians. He says, singing to the Lord over there, but you're singing to God. So the next thing you do is you talk to God. And then, now verse 17 is tricky because your English Bibles, they don't, they miss what he's getting at because verse 17 they say, and whatever you do, do it in word. It doesn't say that. It says, whatever you do in word or in work, 
all of those things giving thanks. They add a word do in there, and he's not saying do it. He's saying whatever you do, whether it's a work or whether it's something you're saying, be thankful. They've added a word in here that misleads us from what he's getting at. In other words, in Ephesians, he just said giving thanks on behalf of everything. Over here, Paul breaks out the everything by saying whether it has to do with what you're saying or whether, whether it what has to do with what you're doing, be thankful in these situations. You show up for a church work day, and there's three of you. Where is everybody else? I'm out of work. I'm thankful. There are three of us, and it's not just me. <laughs> See, it could be that, just as an example. Then, then he also, and we do not have a participle for this because then he actually says, uh, he skips over the whole submitting to one another here. He just goes right into wives, submit, to, uh, uh, submit yourselves. But he's kind of already talked about the submission back in the context. The reason I bring you over here is this is the parallel passage to this. This is passive. I don't know how to be filled. How do I do that? Colossians 3.16 tells me how. I, I am filled. I let the Spirit fill me by setting my mind to who I am in Christ, in the body of Christ, with Christ as the head. I let that truth, that reality, dwell richly in me. Paul has already sort of said that back up in chapter 3 at the first part that Mike went over the other night, where he says, I'm supposed to seek the things that are above, and then I'm supposed to set my mind to the things that are above. I'm supposed to frame my mind with the things that are above. By the time, what time are we supposed to be done here? 10.15. 10, oh, it's, it's time to be done. <laughs> so I'm supposed to be done right now. Um, let's just see if there was anything else. I think we probably got most of it there. Okay. Look at that. Okay. So the filling of the Spirit is the Spirit filling me with the characteristics and qualities and attitudes, responses that I need so that I can be a positive, functioning. I always look at it this way. I can be part of, by being filled, I can be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Very simple terms. We want, he says back in chapter four, we want to guard the unity that the Spirit has created in, the bond of, in, the, in a bond of peace in the body of Christ. And by being filled, I can be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. The Spirit fills me because if I'm not filled, I'm going to be part of the problem. And so the Spirit is going to fill me with these qualities that I need. And I am filled by Colossians 3.16, by setting my mind or framing my mind with who I am in the body of Christ and who we all are together in the Christ, with Jesus Christ as the head. Father, we're thankful for the time you've given us together. We're thankful for your provisions for us by grace. You don't just tell us by our own grit and determination and strength to... Uh, try to get along with other people, but your Holy Spirit who indwells us, you've given him to us and he will fill us with what we need so that we can, uh, so that we can actually really function in a positive way with others in the body of Christ as a part of the body of Christ rather than some sort of a, a burr within the body of Christ, some sort of an annoyance. And we're thankful for that provision for us. Amen.